non-council employees, non-council employees, please leave the main floor of the chambers. There is additional seating upstairs in the balcony. Thank you. Mr. Public Advocate. Good afternoon and welcome to the stated meeting of August 14th, 2019. Uh, I am Public Advocate Jemani Williams. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Adams. Present. Amprey Samuel. Ayala. Present. Barron. Borelli. Brannon. Here. Cabrera. Chin. Here. Cohen. Constantinides. Carnegie. Deutsch, Diaz, Drum, here, Espinal, Eugene, Gibson, Jonai, Grudenchik, Holden, Kalos, King, Ku. Present. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Harrison. Levine. Here. Lewis. Here. Mizell. Here. Menchaca. Presente. Miller. Present. Moya. Perkins. Present. Powers. Here. Reynoso. Richards. Rivera. Present. Rodriguez. Here. Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres, Traeger, Ulrich, here, Valone, here, Van Bramer, Jaeger, here, Matteo, Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. Thank you. I uh, will now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Rabbi Moshe Wiener of the Jewish Community Council of Greater Coney Island, which is located on West 37th Street in Brooklyn. It is an immense privilege to be in the presence of distinguished legislators who have dedicated their lives and careers to the communal benefit. All New Yorkers should stand in your honor. A basic tenet of most religions is the concept of divine providence. The holy Baal Shem Tov, the scholar and saint who founded the Hasidic movement, emphasized that everything we see and hear is ordained by the Almighty and should be viewed as a source of instruction to us. If this applies even to mundane matters, how much more so should we contemplate and be inspired by occurrences of a spiritual nature? Let us examine what we can learn from two phenomena coinciding with this week and this day. Each week in synagogues throughout the world, another biblical section is read and studied based on an annual cycle. Each weekly biblical portion is divided into seven parts corresponding to the seven days of the week. 
The section corresponding specifically to today, Wednesday, is the recounting of the divine revelation on Mount Sinai and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Just a few days ago on Sunday, the fast of Tisha B'Av was observed, which is Judaism's most solemn day of national mourning, commemorating the destruction of both the first and second holy temples in Jerusalem, the exile of the Jewish people from their land, and the horrific persecutions of the Jewish people throughout the centuries, culminating with the Holocaust. What can we learn from the confluence of these two events? Biblical commentators struggle with why the Almighty chose to include in the Ten Commandments not only spiritual precepts, but also civil law ordinances, which human intellect compels. Do we need a divine revelation in order to know not to murder? Does the great ideal of you shall not steal require the prerequisite of I am the Lord your God in order to be sustained? The resolution of this enigma can be derived from the lesson of the fast of Tisha B'Av and its manifestation in our times in the Holocaust. Germany before World War II was a nation of philosophers and scientists. It was a center of culture, art, and music. Yet this same nation murdered millions of innocents in the name of a developed ethic. And they justified genocide on pur purely rational grounds. The gas chambers were not invented by a primitive, barbaric, and illiterate people. To the contrary, this people excelled in sciences and the arts but nevertheless sent 1.5 million children and 4.5 million adults to their deaths solely because they had Jewish blood flowing in their veins. Also hundreds of thousands of individuals from other groups deemed racially inferior were brutally slaughtered. The Nazi era proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that reason alone cannot be counted on to be reasonable because reason can rationalize. The first tablet of the Ten Commandments between man and God is necessary to provide an anchor for the second tablet of civil laws between man and man. May the lesson of the Ten Commandments and the imperative to seek divine guidance and direction inspire our legislation and purpose in life. May we be granted the inner strength and fortitude to ensure that all our decisions and determinations are predicated solely on what is best for our communities and our constituencies and not be tainted by political or other agendas. With that approach, we will certainly be worthy of the blessings articulated in the Sabbath prayers for all those who occupy themselves faithfully with communal affairs. Namely, may the Holy One, blessed be He, give them their reward, remove from them all sickness, heal their entire body, and send blessing and success to all their endeavors, and let us say amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Public Advocate, uh, we could call on Councilmember Deutsch for the invocation, spreading it upon the record. Thank you, Rabbi Wiener, and I now call on Councilmember Deutsch to spread the invocation on the record. Thank you very much, and I just want to um, mention about Rabbi Wiener, who's the executive director of the Jewish Community uh, Council of Greater Coney Island, and all the work that he does, uh, not only for Southern Brooklyn residents, but the entire city of New York, and he, the social services that he has in his staff um, uh, that work with the less fortunate and on behalf of also the Holocaust survivors, uh, the work that he does, and as a son uh, of Holocaust survivors, um, who my father in particular went through three concentration camps. So it's very meaningful, all the work that Robbie Wiener does, and he's a one stop um, for everyone that needs help, anyone that needs services, and I'm fortunate, and we are fortunate, to have him located in southern Brooklyn. And uh, he does work in my district, and his, his uh, facility is in Councilmember Traeger's district. And uh, the work that he does uh, beyond uh, southern Brooklyn is just amazing. So I want to thank you, Robbie Wiener, for giving the invocation today uh, here on the stated meeting of the City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Deutsch. I want to echo that and all the work that uh, Rabbi uh, Wiener and JCC of Greater Coney Island is pretty much known around the city and, of course, in southern Brooklyn. And now we have the adoption of minutes. Councilmember Cumbo. Majority Leader Cumbo, I apologize. 
Thank you, and I also want to extend my regards and respect for Rabbi Weiner, who does an incredible amount of work in my district. So I certainly thank you. Um, it wasn't until they said you were in Councilmember Traeger's district did I then know that you weren't in mine. But I appreciate all that you do and, and, and the wealth of support that you provide, particularly for not-for-profit organizations that are looking to apply for council funding. You do phenomenal work at preparing other organizations um, to do the work throughout Brooklyn, New York, and the city. I make a motion that the minutes of the stated meeting of June 13th, 2019 and June 19th, 2019 be adopted as printed. Messages and papers from the mayor. Excuse me, M178 and 179 mayoral appointments. Rules, privileges, and elections. Communications from city, county, and borough offices. None. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. M180. Uh, thank you. At this time, I'd ask for a roll call vote on today's land use call-up calendar. This is just on land use call-ups, not on the legislation that's before us today. Holden. Adams. Before I give my vote, I'd just like to shout out my SYEP interns, Davia Wilson, Kamora Gailey, Robert Matthews, Jaden Mercado, and Brandon Hamilton. We will miss you this summer, and thank you for your work with my office. I vote aye. Ampri Samuel. Ayala. Aye. Barron. Borelli. Brannon. Aye. Cabrera. Chin. Aye. Cohen. Constantinidis. Cornegie. Deutsch. Diaz. C. Drum. Aye. Espinal. Eugene. Gibson. Jonai. Gordenchik. Yes. Kalos. Aye. King. Ku. Aye. Kozlowitz. Aye. Lansman. Aye. Lander. Aye. Levin. Aye. Levine. Aye. Lewis. Aye. Mizell. Yes. Menchaka. Aye. Miller. Aye. Moya. Aye. Perkins. Aye. Powers. Aye. Reynoso. Aye. Richards. Aye. Rivera. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Rose. Aye. And I'd like to just uh, um, acknowledge my interns, um, Adair, Martinez, and Niha Saida, who um, um, Niha is a sophomore at Brooklyn College, and she's going to law school after graduation, and Adair was um, participated in participatory budgeting and is a junior at Mercy College. And so um, they were excellent, and I'd like to thank them for their service. Rosenthal. Here. Aye. Salamanca. Aye. Torres. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. Aye. Valone. Van Bramer. Jaeger. Aye. Borelli. Aye. Matteo. Combo. Eugene. Council member. Speaker Johnson. Today's land use call ups are adopted by a vote of 39 in the affirmative and zero in the negative. We will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Nice to see you. Good afternoon, and thank everyone for being with us today. I'd like to start by wishing everyone a belated Eid Mubarak. Uh, we are really grateful that we have such a big Muslim population in New York City, and I hope that they 
are enjoying the holidays. Before we jump into our legislative agenda, I'd like to take a few minutes to address some of the deeply sad and shocking news and events that have taken place over the last few weeks since we last met as a body. First and foremost, I, like many of you, am horrified, horrified by the recent slew of shootings and acts of gun violence that have taken place over these last weeks, including those here in New York City, in Brownsville and in Crown Heights. My thoughts are with Council Members Alika Amprey Samuel, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, Council Member Inez Barron, and their communities who continue to have to reel from the pain and attempt to heal after these shootings take place. And I am stunned and heartbroken that we also need to hold space for so many other cities and communities that have felt the impact of gun violence just in the last few weeks. First, the town of Gilroy in California at a festival, and then, of course, we saw what happened in El Paso, Texas, and in Dayton, Ohio on the same day. The enormous amount of damage that has been done by guns and hate in this country has been horrifying for a long time, but it seems like we always reach a new level. And I hope and pray that lawmakers will not just hope and pray, but will, con but will take necessary action at the federal level. But we know that it is on all of us as citizens to continue to call for meaningful change, not just thoughts and prayers, uh, even though we do offer our thoughts and prayers. And I'm incredibly sorry for the families and communities that have been intimately affected by this harm and who continue to grieve in the wake of this senseless gun violence. Moving on again, once again, to individuals that have died from 9-11 related illness since the last stated meeting and when we called on Congress to act and give 9-11 first responders the respect and support that they deserve after 15 years of tireless advocacy, we saw the federal government finally pass and sign a bill to permanently extend the Victims' Compensation Fund. But despite that victory, it's important to remember that we still live with the impact of 9-11 and 9-11 related illnesses. And there are many, many families who continue to be painfully aware of that fact because of what they have to uh, face every single day. And I'd like to take a moment to remember the service members who have passed since our last meeting. James Sotol, a mechanic with the FDNY. Harry Strack, a member of Local 3 IBW who supported electrical work at Ground Zero in the aftermath of the attacks. Officer Raymond Harris, who served in the 77th Precinct of the NYPD. Thomas Fennelly, a firefighter with the FDNY. Anthony Brognano, a detective with the NYPD in Brooklyn. State Police Commander Jeffrey Sikora, who spent 24 years on the force and supported search and recovery efforts at Ground Zero. I'm also incredibly, incredibly saddened by the news of recent deaths of several members of the NYPD. Just this past weekend, Officer Kim Kimberly Lahara passed away when she crashed on the Henry Hudson Parkway. She was 24 years old and served in the NYPD in a precinct on Staten Island. And yesterday we learned that, yet again, another member of the NYPD, Officer Johnny Rios, took his own life. Officer Rios was 35 years old, and this brings the total number of officers who have died by suicide for the year up to eight and six since June. In addition to the heartbreaking news that we received yesterday, the police department also lost Sergeant Terrence McAvoy, who died by suicide at the end of July. My thoughts and prayers are with the families and friends of Officer Lahara, Sergeant McAvoy, Officer Rios, and all of the members of the NYPD during this deeply upsetting time. And we ask any person who's struggling in our city, but also if you are a cop or part of the NYPD, please seek the help that you need. There is no shame in asking for help. Mental illness is the same as any other type of illness, and we want everyone to get the support that they need. The FDNY, unfortunately, also lost one of their own yesterday, Lieutenant Brian Sullivan, 
a 27-year FDNY veteran died from a heart attack after his shift. And additionally, Jose Martins, a construction worker, was killed while working at a construction site in Queens two weeks ago. Granville Wiltshire was also killed by working at a restaurant in Queens, and he was 67 years old. Now I ask that we all rise and have a moment of silence in honor of the many lives that we have lost in the last few weeks, both here in New York City and around the entire country. Thank you. I'd also like to take a minute to, for a few staff announcements. Caitlin O'Hagan, who as many of you know has been a key member of our finance division, is sadly for us leaving the council to pursue her PhD in education policy at NYU. She has been with the council for almost five years, first as Councilmember Gibson's budget director, and then as a senior financial analyst covering education and the capital budget. She is a star, and we are going to miss her. Tomorrow is her last day, and we wish her luck in graduate school. Is she here? There she is. So I want to give Caitlin a very big round of applause, and I want to thank her for amazing work. Also, Monica Abend, who has served in Majority Leader Cumbo's office for the past six years, is leaving the City Council at the end of this month. Monica is moving on to join the office of uh, our Attorney General, Letitia James, where she will serve as a Deputy Director for Intergovernmental Affairs, covering the great boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens. And Monica is someone who many of you know who has served uh, Lori's district and this body so well. We are immensely grateful for her passion and enthusiasm and hard work and talent. I know the majority leader is very grateful for everything that Monica has done. And so I want to say best of luck and congratulations to Monica, wherever she is. Where is she? Is Monica here? There she is. Congratulations, Monica. Okay, we're going to dive into today's agenda. The council will vote on the following Article 11 tax, uh, property tax exemptions approved by the Committee on Finance. 340 South 3rd Street in Councilmember Reynoso's district, Harlem House in Councilmember Bill Perkins's district, and Allenville Manor in Councilmember Richie Torres's district. The council will vote on the following land use items. A 306 seat universal pre-K center in our zoning chair, Councilmember Francisco Moya's district. I know he has worked really, really hard on this. It is a big deal for his community and I would congratulate him on getting this done. We're voting on East New York North NCP, uh, which is an affordable housing development in Councilmember Espinal's district, and two applications in my district, 201 to 207 7th Avenue, a small building, but I have been working on this building for more than a decade, longer than I was in the City Council, so I am very excited about this nine-story small building at the corner of, 20, of 22nd Street and 7th Avenue. Finally, um, and 515 West 18th Street um, Garage Special Permit. Moving on, the council will be voting on the following legislation. First, introduction 30A from Councilmember Margaret Chin, which would significantly strengthen the ability of the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development to recover relocation expenses where a building owner's negligence or failure to maintain a property results in a vacate order and tenant displacement. I want to thank the staff who worked on this bill. Austin Branford and Megan Chen. They are always amazing. And we'll be voting on, we're also going to be voting today on an important set of bills and a resolution related to how some of our federal benefits are administered here in New York City. These bills show 
uphold the council's commitment to treating people with respect and dignity as they make use of our public benefit system. Unfortunately, this vote comes at the same time as yet another vicious and inhumane attack from the Trump administration against our nation's social safety net an attack directly on immigrants and low-income individuals. The new public charge rule put forward by the Trump administration, I believe, is hateful and inhumane and undermines what we stand for as a city and what we should stand for as a nation. And I, of course, want the people of New York City to know that we will continue to stand with our immigrant communities and fight back against these policies. The bills and resolution that we're voting on were introduced after an incredibly disturbing video of one woman's experience and a human resource administration building in Borham Hill came to light last December. These bills cannot change, sadly, what happened to Jasmine Headley or how she and her son were treated, but we are aiming to improve our public benefit system to better serve all New Yorkers. Introduction 1349 from Councilmember Danny Drum will require the NYPD to implement child-sensitive arrest policies that can help minimize trauma and long-term consequences for kids whose caregivers are being arrested. Clearly, officers should not be ripping a baby out of their mother's arms like we saw on that video. And this bill will require the police department to retrain its officers on how to handle situations like Jasmine Headley's, so hopefully it never happens again. I want to thank the staff that worked on this important bill, Daniel Addis, Josh Kingsley, and Brian Crow. In the package of bills specific to the Human Resource Administration, we first have introduction 1382A from Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, which would require HRA to perform an audit of its operations, policies, and procedures at job centers and SNAP centers with the goal of increasing operational efficiency. Related to Councilmember Rosenthal's bill is introduction 1350A from Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, which will require HRA to develop and implement a plan to improve client experiences based on the audit required in Councilmember Rosenthal's bill. HRA would be required to implement that plan by January 1st, 2021. Next is uh, my bill, introduction 1332A, which would codify an Office of Constituent Services within the Department of Social Services. This office would be responsible for receiving and addressing comments, questions, and complaints in a timely manner. The office would also develop strategies and recommendations regarding communication with clients and benefit recipients. People receiving public benefits should be able to navigate the system in a way that doesn't place an undue burden on them, and the Office of Constituent Services will help to ensure that for New Yorkers who turn to HRA. Introduction 1389A, sponsored by our public advocate, Jumani Williams, would require HRA to report on instances in which public assistance was terminated or denied. These reports would, pro would provide valuable insight into the various hurdles public assistance recipients face when applying for or maintaining their benefits. Introduction 1359 is sponsored by Councilmember Steve Levin. Councilmember Levin has done an enormous amount of work to move these bills forward as chair of the Committee on General Welfare, and I really want to personally thank him for his tireless commitment and leadership on this package of bills. His bill would require HRA to report on instances in which public assistance was terminated and subsequently reopened within three months. This data will help us identify how often technical glitches within the state welfare management system cause benefits to be wrongfully terminated. An introduction 1333A from Councilmember Adrian Adams would require HRA to provide reporting on enforcement activity within job and SNAP centers, including on arrests, summonses, removals, escorts, and incidents with use of force. Introduction 1403, sponsored by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, would require HRA to report annually on the number of comments, questions, and complaints made by clients on whether inquiries have been resolved in the most frequent category of inquiries. And next, there are three bills from Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel. Introduction 1335A would establish a pilot program for having social work services available at HRA job centers to interact with clients. The bill would require the provision of these services at every job center by January of 2021. Introduction 1336A would require HRA to conduct trainings on de-escalating conflict and trauma-informed care for all employees who work in job centers or SNAP centers, including contracted security staff. 
and introduction 1337A would require HRA to provide a designated space for children at every job and SNAP center. These spaces would include comfortable seating and age-appropriate educational materials. Introduction 1347A, sponsored by Councilmember Lori Combo, Majority Leader Lori Combo, would require HRA to maintain systems that allow clients to reschedule appointments over the phone. And also from the Majority Leader is Resolution 721. This resolution calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would provide benefit recipients with a grace period before terminating their public assistance or SNAP benefits due to a change in income or employment status. This change would likely be significant for many recipients as it would give them time to contest the termination of benefits and to prepare for the termination. I want to thank the staff who worked on this entire HRA package, Aminta Kilowan, Agatha Mavropoulos, Crystal Pond, Julia Haramis, Smita Deshmukh, and Andrea Vasquez. They worked really, 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 really hard on this package. And uh, are they here? Uh, I think some of them are here. And I really want to thank them for their leadership and help in getting this package done. And finally, Resolution 978 from Councilmember Farrah Lewis calls on Congress to pass and the President to sign the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2019, also referred to as VAWA, which lapsed earlier this year after it was not extended by Congress. I also want to note that this is the first piece of legislation sponsored by Councilmember Farrah Lewis that we are voting on since her election to the Council. So I want to congratulate her on this incredibly, incredibly important resolution. Congratulations, Farah, on this really important resolution we are passing today. And I want to thank the staff who worked on this resolution with Councilmember Lewis, Brenda McKinney, and Chloe Rivera. That concludes our agenda for today's stated meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will now move on to discussion of general orders. First, we have Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you, Public Advocate Jamani Williams, and I want to just begin by simply thanking uh, our Speaker Corey Johnson and again Councilmember Steve Levin and all of my colleagues, particularly the Women's Caucus, for recognizing the great tragedy that happened to Jasmine Headley. And this package of legislation that so many of us have put forward really exemplifies the unity that this body has because. Several individuals made a calculation that day in that HRA office that Jasmine Headley, because she is a black woman, because she is a mother, because she is a single mother looking for services that she is entitled to, somehow didn't matter, and that she had no support, and that she had no backup, and that whatever was going to transpire was going to be business as usual. But today, this council comes together to say, Jasmine, you absolutely have backup. You have 51 council members who are here today to say that you count, you matter, and that we are going to put the appropriate provisions in place uh, to begin to make sure that this rampant behavior does not continue in the city of New York. So I proudly uh, urge all of my colleagues to vote on this package of legislation. This is something that will change the dynamics for so many women across the city and individuals who come to HRA looking for support at a time when they are most vulnerable. So I proudly work with all of my colleagues and thank you all for your support. Thank you, Councilmember Chin, followed by Councilmember Drum. Thank you, Public Advocate. Today we will vote on my bill, Intro 30-A. Far too often, predatory landlords create unlivable conditions that lead to emergency vacate orders that not only uproot tenants' lives, but also force them into a revolving door to the shelter system. As representative of Lower Manhattan, I have seen too many incidents where tenants are forced to pack their entire lives into a suitcase and leave their homes in the middle of the night to evacuate an unstable building that a negligent landlord failed to maintain. It caused an imaginable hardship and trauma. Sometimes it creates a pipeline into the shelter system that is tough to break. As of this month, HPD cites 876 households in emergency shelter as a result of a vacate order. We cannot allow greedy landlords to take a backseat to the suffering they have caused and drag their feet on making the repairs to lift a vacate order. 
Intro 30A will force these landlords to pay up, creating a system for the city to charge landlords for temporary housing for these tenants. By passing this bill, we are introducing a new tool to hold the city's worst landlord accountable and push them to speed up the repair process to bring these families back home sooner. I thank Speaker Johnson and Housing and Building Chair Carnegie for your support and also the council lawyers and legislative staff, including Megan Chan, Austin Bradford, uh, Janan Zilka, as well as HBD staff for your work to push this through, and my deputy chief of staff, Marion Guerra, for getting us to the finish line. I urge my colleagues to vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and the Public Safety Chair Donovan Richards for the commitment to reviewing how city agencies, including HRA and the NYPD, interact with individuals throughout the city. Last year's unfortunate incident involving Jasmine Headley highlighted the need for law enforcement to proceed with due sensitivity. When arrest of parents and caretakers are inevitable, the police should be following proper procedures that consider the welfare of the children involved. Intro 1349A does this by requiring the creation of guidance aimed at reducing the trauma of arrest on both parents and their children. Such guidance will minimize the more traumatizing aspects of parental arrest and provide such parents the opportunity to ensure that their children are in safe hands. Notably, the NYPD will be, requ will be required to work with partner organizations to offer assistance to arrested parents. Together with my council colleagues and the advocates, including Tanya Krupat of the Osborne Association, the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents, and Sebastian McGuire and my council, I look forward to continuing to examine ways in which we can mitigate the harmful collateral impacts of the criminal justice system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Drum. Just a, a point of personal privilege. Um, on December of 2018, we all uh, saw in the experience of Jasmine Headley the worst of what our government has to offer uh, people of the city of New York. And today, I'm glad that we are showing the best of what government has to offer in response to what occurred. I'm very proud to have a, a bill in this package, a companion bill uh, to. Uh, the committee chair 11. So I just want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson and committee chair 11 and all uh, the council members who are part of this and the entire body uh, for, uh, as the majority leader said, not letting this issue go and making sure we did something about it to try to prevent it from happening again. I want to thank committee staff Agatha Maropoulos and my first deputy for policy, Nick Smith, and director of legislation, Michelle Kim. And. Um, there's none other listed for general order, so we will move on to the report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Finance, pre-considered Reso 1022, Transparency Reso. Coupled on general orders. Pre-considered LU 501 and Reso 1029 through LU 504 and Reso 1032, tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on General Welfare, intro 1332A through 1403A on page 4, HRA package. Coupled on, amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, intro 30-A, vacate orders. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 477 and Reso 1033, and LU 478 and Reso 1034, UDAP Manhattan. Couple of general orders. LU 479 and 480, Avenue U rezoning. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. Excuse me. LU, LU, fi <laughs> LU 500 and Reso 1035, Franklin Guest House. Coupled on general orders. Pre-considered LU 505 and Reso 1036, pre-kindergarten center. Coupled on general orders. Pre-considered LU 506 and Reso 1037, UDAP 190 Essex Street. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Public Safety, intro 1349A, child sensitive policies. Amended and coupled on general orders. On the general order calendar, intro 1281A. Laid over. LU 466 and Reso 1038, West 18th Street Garage. Coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various person, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled on general orders, and at this time I ask for a roll call vote on all of the items on today's general order calendar. Holden. Aye on all. Rosenthal. With permission to explain my vote of aye on all, uh, with gratitude to my colleagues, Councilmember Chin, your bill will address issues that happen in my district all the time. Uh, really appreciate your hard work on that. Councilmember Drum, really appreciate your work in making sure the NYPD and those who think they can just 
rip a baby out of a mother's hand, that that just won't happen again. Um, and to all my colleagues, Councilmember Levin, for your leadership uh, in moving this legislation through the General Welfare, General Welfare Committee. Um, I just want to say it is imperative that we get to the bottom of the institutional failures that led to HRA's terrible treatment of Jasmine Headley. Ms. Headley and too many other New Yorkers are essentially being punished for their need to ask for assistance as if poverty were a crime. As a society, that is our failure, not theirs. I vote aye and all. Thank you very much. Adams. Permission to explain my vote. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. All she needed was a chair, and what she got was her one-year-old baby wrestle from her arms. What she got was arrested and jailed when she could have been at her job providing for her child. The horrible details of Jasmine Headley's experience at a Brooklyn HRA center went viral in December. Protocol inside HRA offices is in desperate need of reform. I'm proud to join my colleagues in a package of legislation to improve treatment of clients and quality of service at HRA centers. My bill, 1333A, would require the Department of Social Services, Human Resources Administration, to report on arrests, summonses, removals, escorts, and use of force incidents occurring in their centers. This bill is a necessary step to improve accountability and transparency, and I want to thank Speaker Johnson, Council Member Levin for their leadership in championing, championing this groundbreaking legislation. I'd like to thank the entire body for your support and your spirit to propel Jasmine Headley into a positive row instead of a negative row, and I encourage my colleagues to support this entire package to prevent families in need from, incur from incurring unnecessary future trauma or brutality ever again. I vote aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Borelli. Aye on all. Brennan. Aye on all. Chin. Uh, permission to explain my vote. I just want to take this opportunity um, to congratulate all my colleagues on the uh, HRA package um, legislation. And I hope that this will bring reform to HRA to really do the job to help people in need and to treat them with the respect that they deserve. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank my wonderful summer intern um, who's been great working with us in the district office and also in the legislative office, James O'Grady, uh, V. Bu, Joanne Zen, Han Yu Lin, and Mila Sujani. And I vote aye on all. Thank you. Mario. Cohen. Carnegie. I'd just also like to take a chance to um, say what a pleasure it was to work with my summer interns, Samora, Kayla, Javoye, and Emmanuel, some of which will be returning to major colleges and universities um, around the country. Um, you, you guys are awesome. Uh, ah. Deutsch. Permission to, to explain my vote. So intro 1403 as part of this package of bills re will require public reporting of the number and nature of complaints, comments, and questions by HRA and DSS clients. This information will aid us in, ident in identifying the most common issues faced by those seeking assistance from these city agencies. Every year, my office helps hundreds of people navigate the system to receive benefits. They often report back about an acceptable and appropriate way they are treated, whether it is verbal abuse, being made to wait for many hours, or being forced to jump through bureaucratic hoops. We need to end any mistreatment of those who may be down on their luck. This bill, along with other bills in this package, sponsored by my colleagues, will take preventive action to ensure that our fellow New Yorkers are not subjected to traumatic experiences as they attempt to put food on the table and care for their families. So with that said, I vote, I, uh, I vote no on intro 1349 
And uh, while I support and appreciate int the intent of intro 1349, uh, I believe it's an excellent bill, just I have some, um, I have some issues um, by tying the hands of law enforcement when to report to ACS. Uh, when people uh, reach out to me in my office, um, I always take the approach to better safe than sorry policy. And um, with that being said, I vote no on 1349 and on the rest. Diaz. Si en todo. Drum. Aye. Eugene. Aguray. Gordenchik. Aye. Kalos. Ku. Aye, Oma. Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Lanceman. Aye. Lander. Aye on all. Levin. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, thank you very much, Public Advocate. I just want to um, I want to thank the speaker um, and uh, council members Adams, uh, Cumbo, Amphrey Samuel, uh, Gibson, uh, sorry, I'm reading through all the names here. Rosenthal, uh, you, the public advocate, Councilmember Deutsch, um, for uh, all the work that everybody did here on uh, this historic set of legislation uh, that really seeks to shine a light on uh, the practices at HRA, at the job centers and SNAP centers, and ensuring that our government is accountable uh, to the residents of New York and that everybody is treated with the dignity that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And um, we have that obligation as a city um, to strive to do better. Um, and when we see an injustice like what happened to Jasmine Headley, um, to, to commit ourselves to fixing it. Um, and so I wanna thank Jasmine herself, um, her, um, mm -hmm. uh, she, she testified in front of uh, the committee on this legislation. Um, she exhibited a tremendous amount of courage um, in the face of a really devastating experience. Um, and she chose to, um, to turn um, that terrible experience into um, uh, a mission and um, into motivation. And so I, I just want to thank her and acknowledge all the uh, bravery that she has exhibited. Um, and in particular, I just want to thank, oh, I want to thank uh, all the committee staff that worked on this legislation. And, and then in particular, I want to thank uh, my colleague, Majority Leader Cumbo, um, uh, Councilmember Adams, uh, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel, Councilmember Rosenthal, um, for, uh, for bringing such uh, moral clarity to this issue um, uh, throughout the last several months and, um, and for really leading uh, this body on this legislation. I want to thank them. Thank you. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Levine. Vote aye on all. Lewis. Permission to explain my vote? I want to congratulate um, all of my colleagues on today's passage of the Justice for Jasmine legislative um, the legislative package that you all worked so hard on and for your attention um, and advocacy for all individuals like Jasmine who won't have to experience this type of inhumane treatment. So thank you all for your hard work on this package. I also want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership in moving um, resolution 978 forward um, in which we're calling on Congress and the president to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Authorization Act. It's demoralizing that we have to ask each and every year for the federal government to renew this life-saving piece of legislation. And as a survivor of domestic violence and domestic abuse, I understand firsthand why these resources are needed and why these resources are tailored for folks like myself to ensure that we have a place of refuge and resources to make it to the next day. Um, by passing this resolution, we are sending a clear message that- Council member, yes. we can do that when we do the resolutions. Sorry? When we do the resolutions, we'll be doing resolutions. Oh, sorry. No problem. I don't know. Kalos. I. Maisel. Yes. Menchaca. Permission to explain my vote? 
I want to I thank Councilmember Lewis for her legislative victory and the rest of the City Council and packages that we're passing today. I want to also give light to a transparency resolution that you're also voting on today that includes a $4 million, almost $4 million package of resources that we're giving to citywide organizations and smaller organizations to focus on census work. Uh, this is work that's coming out of the task force that uh, uh, Speaker Johnson uh, point, appointed myself and Councilmember Rivera. Uh, there's an incredible team behind this that's working day and night to really build a focused response with the administration and I'm so happy that this is the first tranche of, of money. This funding is gonna to go to really prepare organizations that have been thinking about this for uh, years. And I hope that the council members that are here today present understand that we're gonna keep working and that each and every one of you are gonna be responsible in a lot of ways to really ensure that the count is and happens in your districts. Some of these census tracts are gonna be hard to get to, but we're gonna rely on our work because we know our districts more than anyone else. And so I want to say thank you uh, for supporting this resolution, this transparency resolution, to the finance team and the entire task force staff, and to my partner, um, Carlina Rivera. I'll go to war with you anywhere. Um, thank you so much. I vote aye on all. Miller. Permission to explain my vote, please? Um, I first want to thank my colleagues, particularly uh, Chair Levin and those involved in this. Uh, package of legislation that promotes um, and protects human dignity. And I also want to say in doing so, um, what I noticed that this bill does and, and includes also, it is that when we, I as the chair of civil service and labor, talk about the job that is being done to provide critical services. In providing those services, it is training, it is supervision, it is guidance, it is tools and resources that are necessary and this is a bold package that ensures that the tools and resources for everybody to do their job properly is being done. I'd also like to take the opportunity to um, highlight and thank my uh, summer interns as well, Nisha Chaudhary and Anika uh, Lamia, and as well as I have with me today, Mr. Dane Allen and Mr. Jordan Robinson, who are recent graduates of um, Eagle Academy School for Young Men are on their way to Cornell and American University, respectively, and we are expecting great things to come back to the council very soon. So thank you, and I vote aye on all. Moya. Aye on all. Perkins. Aye on all. Powers. Aye on all. Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Richards. Aye on all. Rivera. Permission to explain my vote briefly? I just want to say a thank you to everyone for, for the package and getting justice for Jasmine Headley and to Councilmember Menchaca and everyone who assisted us with census funding. And I think, but though most importantly, to Councilmember Lewis for not just pushing your resolution forward, but for sharing your personal story. Congrats to all, and I vote aye. Rodriguez. Aye. Rose. Aye. Salamanca. Aye and all. Torres. Aye. Traeger. Permission to explain my vote? Uh, thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you, my colleagues. My apologies for missing the vacation earlier. I was on a call to deal with lead in schools, which I will be following up on to make sure that our children and staff are safe. But I do appreciate Rabbi Wiener for, for his invocation here today. Uh, I want to congratulate all my colleagues uh, on their very important, groundbreaking, historic legislation being passed, uh, addressing very serious issues in our city. Um, and I just want to uh, note, uh, the speaker mentioned earlier, um, Caitlin O'Hagan. Uh, if there is one person uh, that knows literally where every dime is budgeted in a over $32 billion DOE budget, it is Caitlin O'Hagan. Um, she has a mastery understanding of the DOE's budget process, numbers, the SEA capital plan, which we're still grappling with. She is an enormous, tremendous asset here that we have in the New York City Council. She is the official fact checker when it comes to the budget process with DOE, the largest city agency and department 
Her service has been invaluable to me as chair of the committee. I'm sure my colleague, Councilman Chair Drum, would agree that she has been a dynamo and a force uh, in so many different ways. Um, and she is entering a prestigious uh, PhD program at NYU, which is NYU's big gain. But I've, I've asked her to continue to serve the city in some greater capacity. So Caitlin, thank you for your enormous, tremendous service to the city council. You have made me a more effective uh, chair of a very important committee here in the city council. We are grateful for your service. Thank you so much. And with that, I vote aye on all. Ulrich. Yes. Valone. Jaeger. Apologize. Uh, I on all with the exception of intro 1349 in which I vote no and with the exception of resolution 1022 in which I abstain. Thank you. Combo. I vote aye. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye on all. All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 41 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of intro 1349A, which is adopted by a vote of 39 in the affirmative, two in the negative, and one abstention, and resolution 1022, which was adopted by a vote of 40 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and one abstention. The revised land use call-up vote, uh, the revised land use call-up vote is 41 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and we'll now have the introduction and reading of the bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. We will now move into the discussion of resolutions. Uh, are there any members who would like to speak on today's resolutions? And I believe Council Member Lewis. Thank you. As I stated earlier, um, I just want to thank Speaker Johnson for his leadership and for moving this resolution forward and accelerating um, the progress of Reso 978, asking for Congress and the President to reauthorize the Women Against, sorry, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. This is an opportunity for us to stand up for survivors right here in our city and the United States. So we're asking for Congress to move forward with reauthorizing this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. This is my first time back uh, since the primary, so I want to make sure I put on the record congratulating you. Uh, congratulations on your first piece of legislation and in your courage in sharing your personal story attached to it. And I want to just revise a vote, uh, intro 1349A, which was adopted by a vote of 39 in the affirmative, two in the negative, and zero abstentions. Seeing no one else uh, for uh, comments on the resolutions. I'll now read today's resolutions into the record. Members who wish to vote against or abstain on any of the resolutions to register your vote with the clerk at the dais. Resolution 721, resolution calling on the state legislature, legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would provide a grace period before terminating public assistance or supplemental nutrition assistance program, also known as SNAP, benefits to, due to a change in income and or employment to allow time to con contest the termination of benefits or prepare for the termination. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. Resolution 978, resolution calling upon Congress to pass and the President to sign the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2019. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. And we will now move into general discussion. We have signed up Council Members Levine and Council Members Grove. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. We, okay. Council Member Levine, e yes. Excellent. Um, there are 600,000 people in the five boroughs of New York City who lack health insurance. Many of them are undocumented immigrants. And I am pleased to be joining with Speaker Johnson 
and Councilmember Carlina Rivera today to introduce a bill that would establish a program to help those hundreds of thousands of New Yorks who lack basic health care. This is intro 1668, which would establish a citywide, five borough, comprehensive system of primary care health based in clinics and public hospitals to allow low-income New Yorkers, people who lack health insurance, to access the basic components of health care, from annual physicals to vaccinations to referrals to specialists. This is an incredibly important initiative. I expect that our colleagues will be hearing much about it in the weeks ahead, and I encourage all of you to join us as co-sponsors on what we believe will be extremely consequential for low-income New Yorkers, for undocumented immigrants, and, and those in need of health care in New York City. Thank you. Mr. Republic, I just want to say I'm really grateful for Councilmember Levine, the chair of our health committee's leadership on this, and I look forward to this bill being heard. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. Thank you, public advocate. My colleagues today, I'm thrilled to announce two bills, one which aims to increase the use of summer meals and one that expands SYAP to include all children, regarding, regardless of their immigration status. Intro 1675 will call for the Department of Education to mail summer meal information included to all eligible students. This information would include th uh, the three nearest locations, operations hours, and eligibility guidelines. Summer meals are offered to all children under ages 18 and under at no cost at several sites across our city, including public schools, community pools, public parks, libraries, and NYCHA locations throughout June throughout um, June through August. Low-income parents often rely on New York City school food for free meals for their children throughout the school year. So this would make sure that um, parents and students would know um, that the mail, meals are available and where they are available um, to them. The second bill, bill also relates to our young people. I'm proud to join public advocate Jamani Williams in intro 1670, a bill that would make all young people of New York City, regardless of immigration status, eligible for summer youth employment program. I know firsthand how important SYAP is and um, we, would want, we want all of our young people from across the city to have that same opportunity. We should not perpetuate a two-tiered system among our youth. We're living in New York City. If you're attending our public schools, you're a New Yorker. And so it's in everyone's best interest to have these opportunities available. Um, and I'm really proud to co-author this with um, public advocate Williams. Um, Inez Barron, Council Member Barron, asked me to, to recognize and thank her intern in her absence, Aniqua Faz. She's an intern for Council Member Barron in her legislative office and once a week at the district office. She's entering her third year at Baruch College with a major in operational management, and her interests are working with college students and teaching. And I know um, Council Member Barron um, thanks her for her service to her office. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Majority Leader Combo. Thank you. I rise simply to recognize critically acclaimed author Toni Morrison, who died on August 5th. She was an American novelist, essayist, editor, teacher, and professor emeritus at Princeton. Um, many know her for her first book, The Bluest Eye, which was written in 1970. Her first novel published at the age of 40, which really just goes to show that we have so many lives in us and so many opportunities to be who we were always meant to be. She was critically acclaimed for her Song of Solomon, which brought her national attention and won the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 1988, she won the Pulitzer Prize and American Book Award for Beloved. She is a national treasure. She has someone that has influenced American culture greatly. She has always had her uh, finger on the pulse of politics and world affairs. She will be greatly missed. She is an American legend, a hero, and certainly someone who is going to continue to influence our literary world 
um, throughout. And I hope that we feel all inspired by what she has been able to accomplish and all of the work and the, and the, the masterpieces that she has produced that will always be a part of the American record and certainly an inspiration to all African Americans throughout this world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman McCumber. And I would like to uh, ask my colleagues to also sign on to um, intro 1670, co-sponsored by myself, uh, Council Member Rose, who spoke on it, and Council Member Chin. This morning, we had about 200 teenagers come out for a press conference in support of the Youth Employment Education Program uh, to parallel the Summer Youth Employment Program, uh, but ensuring that all uh, residents and young people, regardless of the immigration status, can get the essential skills needed uh, uh, to be their best residents uh, when they get older. Uh, and I want to thank the speaker for bringing up the gun violence that's been occurring not only around the country, but also in uh, this city. And I hope that this body uh, takes some time to uh, be prideful. Uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, this body started a initiative uh, that was a lot of people had some skepticism on uh, with $5 million. That initiative is now over $40 million. There's an Office of Gun Violence Prevention based on the work of uh, Joy Lee Combo and Gibson that has uh, been proven to help reduce gun violence in this city. And so I hope this body is proud of the work it's done. Uh, hopefully continue pushing that forward uh, with funding and resources and credit to the crisis management system that's sometimes left out in this discussion on the supply side while we wait for our federal government to hopefully do something on the demand of, uh, so, so on, on the supply side of gun violence. With that. Oh, thank you. And we're going to call again on Majority Leader Combo. Not at all trying to monopolize since I'm seated in this seat. But I wanted to just, um, Speaker Corey Johnson already has done so, so eloquently, but I just wanted to wish Monica Aben, my Chief of Staff, um, and Legislative Director, uh, a farewell. Uh, she has done so much for my office over the years, and she started in my office in 2014, and she has continued to do extraordinary work. We began our careers 10 years ago as arts administrators and found ourselves here at City Hall trying to make our way um, throughout these halls, and it's been an honor and a privilege to work with her. We have accomplished so much blood, sweat, and tears. We fight like cats and dogs, but she has remained loyal throughout her time here, and many know her for her passion uh, and her strength and her determination to get the job done. And I just wanted to just you know, state a few of the, the dynamic things we were able to accomplish together, the anti-sexual harassment training, lactation rooms and businesses and government office, NYPD sexual assault training, creation of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence, DOE, sex ed, reporting and transparency, percent for art increases, pay equity reporting, MWBE advisory board reporting and transparency, creation and codification of the Commission on Gender Equity, text 911, as well as the Manage the Committee on Women and Women's Caucus during 2014 and 2018. So we've done a lot together. We all didn't get the credit for all the work that our staff does, but she's done extraordinary work. I'm so proud of her. She will be amazing um, in everything that she does. And I just want to say to public advocate Jamani Williams, as well as Attorney General uh, Tish James, you have an incredible talent um, at poach, I mean recruiting from my office, the most talented individuals throughout <laughs> the city of New York. And I'm confident that my staff will continue to make both of you um, incredible leaders as you already are. And we will be having Kate to celebrate Monica downstairs in the members' lounge. So if you all would like to join us and have a slice of cake, that would be awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Now, nice shout out to my first deputy for community engagement, Crystal <laughs> Hudson. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, the work we did here had to do on the demand side, and we are looking for federal government to work on the supply side of gun violence. Uh, uh, Council Member Miller. Thank you, public advocate. I, I didn't want to get out of here. I'd be remiss for all the inquiring minds that were wondering about this um, Mylar balloon, balloon legislation um, that I will be introducing along with Councilmember Costanides and Espinal. Um, mylar balloons are made of metallic nylon materials that, which short circuit electrical power lines and pose serious power risk, fire, and electrical outages. Last December, Con Ed determined that uh, in my district, the, the Hollis Power Station 
um, was compromised by one of these balloons rising and, um, and taking out the uh, trans transformer and um, taking out the power to 1,500 households. This is the second time that this, is, this has occurred in our district. As we saw last month from the heat wave and uh, related outages in Brooklyn and Queens and, and Manhattan, our electrical infrastructure is already uh, incredibly vulnerable and who would think that a balloon can take out infrastructure in such a way. This legislation seeks to inform consumers by requiring retailers to attach a label about warnings about the risk of fire electrical outages due to these balloons and its weight prior to its sale. Failure to do so would incur a civil penalty for um, the balloons being improperly sold. And I encourage my colleagues to vote uh, yes on this. Thank you. Councilmember Gordenchik. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Public Advocate, and I just beg the indulgence of my colleagues here. Um, I have to tell you, I was quite annoyed to read that um, an administration official of the current federal administration believes that the words of the new Colossus that stand at the base of our Statue of Liberty need to be rewritten. And I was offended because 116 years ago, my grandfather, uh, just before Christmas, my grandfather, Max Aaron Gradenchik, he sailed past the Statue of Liberty, was soon joined by Celia Baryshansky, who he married 109, 10, 11 years ago in Councilwoman Chin's district on East Broadway, and they were followed by my grandparents, Chaim Rosenfeld and Fanny Malamud. And so, with the indulgence of my colleagues, I would like to read The New Colossus, which was written by a native New Yorker, Emma Lazarus, a Sephardic Jewess um, who died much too young. And the poem goes like this, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset, sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning in her name, mother of exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome and her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, she cries with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp behind, beside the golden door. She doesn't mention that they should come from Europe or Africa or Asia or any other place on the face of the earth. This city has been welcoming people from all over the world for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think Ms. Lazarus got it exactly right. And that, that is why, to this day, that poem is on the Statue of Liberty. May it ever be so. And thank you to my colleagues for listening to that today. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Traga. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, colleagues, I'm also uh, pleased to introduce a bill today that prioritizes uh, swimmer safety. There have been too many tragedies this summer in the water, and our city must do everything uh, possible to, to protect our swimmers. Uh, my bill that I'm introducing will amend the code, administrative code in New York City in relation to requiring the demarcation of boating and bathing areas at city beaches. This will make it clear through the use of buoys or signs to boats, jet skis, and other watercrafts that they cannot enter designated swimming areas. In my district, jet skis often speed into the swimming area, endangering children and our families. But even when the NYPD Harbor Unit is ticketing offenders, offenders are able to fight the ticket and beat the ticket because there aren't currently any clear markings where they can and cannot enter. This bill will change that and make sure all swimmers feel safe and secure in the water. And I appreciate my colleagues for their time and for their support. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll now call on the speaker to close today's meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. I want to end by just uh, thanking everyone, of course. I hope everyone has a safe summer. And I just want to, of course, publicly state um, Donovan Richards is a fantastic member of this body, and I am extraordinarily proud that he is chair of our Public Safety Committee. I think he has done a wonderful job in that position. He has uh, spoken his mind. He has talked about his personal experience. And he has my complete and full confidence in support, and I wanted to say that on the record today at this stated meeting. Thank you, Donovan, for your leadership, for your advocacy, for being a thoughtful and great leader in this city and in chairing that committee. 
And with that, today's stated meeting of <clears throat> August 14th, 2019 is hereby adjourned. <clears throat>